Good evening. Well, thank you for a warm welcome to everybody at the library, including Eric, who has been showing me around. And uh, I'd like to first of all congratulate the community because this is an amazing facility you have. This is an asset to the community. So congratulations for having the Linda Hall Library in your backyard. Okay. So um, here's my title page, and this is me at the South Pole. Little known trivia fact, there is a pole at the South Pole. <laughs> so that is the pole that marks the South Pole. Um, the geographic South Pole uh, is sometimes confused with the magnetic South Pole. Um, the geographic South Pole is if you take a globe and you spin it, it's, it's right where the, the sticks meet. The, the, it's right here. Okay. So that's where I am right here in the picture. Uh, something to think about. Standing there, every direction I can face is north. Think about that. How do maps work at the South Pole, right? Every direction is north. Yeah, okay, so now that I've blown your mind with just that thought, <laughs> I'm going to start off with a little video. So I used to be a, a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin where the Ice Cube Project is headquartered. And, and in 2013, we made a very important discovery in neutrinos. So I'd like to show a little promo video that they made of, of us. Ah, it comes from above, right? Yeah, it so it should be like this. It should be like that. It should be like that. The best days are when we had, when we had the new data. And so every couple of minutes, it would bring up a new one on the screen. And I remember just going, what's the number? What's the number? Because the more events from outer space you have, the more I can do to find clusters or hot spots in the sky. Being able to work there, one of the most exciting things that I, that I have done in my life. The Ice Cube project transforms a big block of ice a mile deep under the geographic South Pole into a particle physics detector. We are looking for neutrinos that come from further away. I really wanted to do neutrino astrophysics. I, I really wanted to keep doing neutrino astrophysics, and, and really Ice Cube is the experiment. And last April, our Japanese colleagues found two events at super high energies. And as soon as I saw these two events, I realized this was something different we had never seen before, despite the fact we had seen literally hundreds of thousands of neutrinos by them. I think as scientists, there's always this like, you have to balance your, oh my God, it's so exciting, where could they possibly be from, to analyze these in a very, you know, concrete, statistical way. Then your mind starts racing like, well, what can we do with the, the data? What, what more can we learn? How can we squeeze every information we can out of this? For me, it was important to get to a group where you, where you have a lot of people to whom we work with and a lot of um, experts in, in different parts of, of, of the DEM detector. You know, when we published these results, we published them with 250 names on the paper in alphabetical order. Because you know, the person that drilled the hole 15 years ago is as important as someone who wrote the latest software to extract the event. To not only work for my himself, getting my own own the thesis done, but to um, yeah, work with others and, and, and get exciting things done by, by, by having a team of people. There's something very fundamentally human about coming together and trying to discover. But At the end of the day, the I, I felt like it was worth you spending your life on. See the scattering. Yeah. So, um, I hope you learned a little bit more about neutrinos, and I hope you learned, uh, for the younger people in the audience, especially uh, women and girls, I hope you learned that you can be a pregnant physicist. <laughs> <laughs> they are, we are out there. <laughs> so, uh, let me start the talk. Uh, I'll get to everything that was covered in the video, but let me start the talk um, with a thought experiment, because I am a physicist, I, I like experiments, and let's do a thought experiment. So pretend for now that you are an alien and you've never seen a human hand. You don't have a hand, okay? This, this hand, my hand, is the only hand you've ever seen. How would you study my hand? You can't come up and touch it. The only thing you can do is to do whatever you can from where you're seated. 
but you want to learn more about my hand. Well, you can look at it and say, okay, well, there's, there's this flat part, and then there's five things coming out. Um, my hand is reddish, yellowish color. Uh, if you could see the backside, you'd know that I have nails, or what I would call nails. But actually, the best thing to do is to look at it in different visions. So if you had x-ray vision, you would know that I have bones inside my hand. If you had MRI vision, you'd know that I have muscle inside my hand. In infrared, if you do heat sensing goggles, you know that my hand is warm. So all this information that you can get about my hand without ever coming to my hand, the, the best way to study something that you cannot get to is by looking at it in different, different pairs of eyes. And that's exactly the same for astronomy. So here is the Crab Nebula, and it is, um, well, it says star with gas cloud around it, but this star has, we think, exploded a very long time ago, and the explosion just keeps going. Okay, how do we know that? We know that because we've studied this in different pairs of eyes. Here, I've, this is the exact same spot in the sky seen in radial, UV, optical, and x-ray. Exact same spot, and you can see that they all pick out different features of the same thing. So just like that hand thought experiment that we did, our best way to study distant things that we cannot get to by spacecraft is to look at it in different pairs of eyes. And what we'd like to do in IceCube is to add another set of eyes, um, and that is in neutrinos. So we'd like to see the universe in neutrinos. So what are neutrinos? This is the hardest thing for me to talk about. Um, <laughs> neutrinos are elementary particles, which doesn't mean much, um, I, I think, to, to say that. But what are elementary particles? So me, you, air, desk, computer, everything is made up of molecules. Molecules are made up of atoms. And atoms are made up of the nucleus and the electron spinning around it. Now, as far as we know, the electron is not made up of anything. Elect the electron is a fundamental particle. The nucleus is made up of nucleons, which are protons and neutrons. And if we smash that, if we smash it at very high energies, we know that they're made up of things called quarks. And quarks, as far as we know, are elementary particles. They're not made up of anything. They are the fundamental building blocks of everything and everything in the universe. So that's what fundamental particles are. They're, they're particles that, as far as we know, you, you cannot smash it up into smaller pieces. Um, neutrinos are one of those particles, except they're not, they don't make up the, the atom or the molecule, so they don't make up us. So neutrinos are, are a different fundamental particle, and, and they, they rarely interact. They're sometimes called the invisible or ghost particle. And what I mean by that is you can have a neutrino going through stuff, and, and they'll just go through it. If I had a neutrino beam, which I can never make, but if I had it and I shot it at you, it, it'll just go through all of you. Um, it, it rarely interacts. Okay, what else do I want to say about this? Hmm. So I'm, I'm sure you're very unhappy about that explanation, <laughs> but that's the best I can do. I'm sorry. Um, neutrinos are coupled to nuclear reactions. So uh, if there is a nuclear reaction in an atom, neutrinos are often emitted. Uh, nuclear reactors emit neutrinos. Actually, we emit neutrinos, even though we're not made up of neutrinos, we emit neutrinos once in a while because our body has potassium and potassium can decay. So the, the atoms of potassium, wherever it is in my body, once in a while decays and it emits neutrinos. So we are neutrino emitters as well as the sun, earth, everything that goes through fission or fusion. And Turns out that stars and galaxies go through them. So here is a schematic of what I mean by we want to do astronomy with neutrinos. Um, the, the way we think about astronomy is that the, at the fundamental level, you go outside in a clear night, like uh, maybe it's not clear anymore tonight, um, and you look at the sky and, and you see stars. And how do you know, how do your eyes know that stars are out there? It's because amazingly, Whatever is there, billions of light years away, emit enough light that some photons enter your eyes. Those photons, whatever photons they were, whenever they were created, were destined to hit your eyes, your own eyes, not anybody else's. And because your eyes collect photons from that star, you can pick out that there's more photons right there 
than anywhere around it where it's dark. And that's how you know there's a star out there. Amazing. We want to do the same thing in neutrinos. Um, so here is us, and just imagine that you're standing in Earth anywhere. Um, so gamma is what we usually use for photons, that's light. And photons are great because you, you, your eyes can see them, your telescope can see them. I showed you a couple of images of the Crab Nebula and photons. They're, they're great for viewing, but there's, there's one thing not so great about them, and it's that if there's something between me and the source I'm interested in, it tends to get blocked, light gets blocked. So if I was a star you're interested in, and you are the observer, and I hide behind my laptop, you can't see me because photons don't go through my laptop, right? It's the same thing. We, we can see lots of stars that are unobscured, but we can't see a lot of things, and particularly energetic things in the universe because they're often surrounded by lots of cloud and gas, and photons don't make it out. So, we think a, an interesting new way to do astronomy is using neutrinos because if you remember the properties of neutrinos, the ghost particle, they go through everything. So um, I don't know if you can tell, this is such a bad schematic, I'm, I apologize, but the, the gamma line becomes thinner when it interacts with, but the neutrino line goes straight and it doesn't deplete as we call it in physics. Now you say, well, why neutrinos? Why not use electrons, anything else? We could. Um, there, there are other part our particles other than neutrinos and photons, light, that we could use to do astronomy. The problem is those particles are usually electromagnetically charged. And when particles are electromagnetically charged, they bend in magnetic fields. So those, for those of you who've taken physics in, in undergraduate level know this, right? So if you have, say, a, a really interesting black hole far away and you want to study what happens there, and you want to get the electrons from it, for example, then the electrons travel, but they start bending because they encounter magnetic fields between me and us. The universe is filled with magne magnetic fields, it turns out. And so by the time they get to us and we see these particles, and we usually see them in the form of air showers, uh, particle air showers, um, you point back and you don't point back to where they came from. So that's the problem. So in a nutshell, what we think is the next best viable option after light is neutrinos to study the universe. Um, before two, the year 2013, which you saw in the video, this was, this was still a little bit of a dream because we had never detected very high energy neutrinos from the universe. Everybody thought they would be there, but nobody had seen it. So we had never, not, not only has, have we not seen a star in neutrinos or a galaxy in neutrinos, we had never even seen a neutrino from space. Uh, and, and in 2013, that changed and we changed that and that was the big discovery. So here's another thought experiment. Who's ever been buried in snow? Okay. If you, if you go ahead first, is it, is it bright or does, does it get dark pretty quickly? Yeah, it gets dark pretty quickly, right? So, okay. Think if you're buried in one mile of snow, do you think you should see any light down there? No, it's actually pitch black. So if you were buried, if, if there was a place in the world where there's one mile of snow, you see where I'm getting at, um, and you bury yourself there, it'll be complete darkness except for when elementary particles go through and they emit light. And this is called Cherenkov radiation. And that is why our detector, our ice cube detector, is buried at the South Pole in the ice because we want it to be down where it's completely black and dark and see these elementary particles. So here is a schematic of the South Pole. When you, it turns out when you land at the South Pole, um, you, the South Pole is in Antarctica, and Antarctica is a continent, so there's a continent down there. But when I land at Antarctica, and at the South Pole particularly, I am actually standing on two miles of ice. There is a huge glacier at the South Pole. And what we've done in the experiment, an ice cube, is to drill down, all the way down 2.5 kilometers, or roughly two miles, and instrument, as in put in, light sensors in a cubic kilometer volume of ice. And these light sensors collect that light, the Cherenkov radiation that these particles emit. Cubic kilometer size. Think about that. For those of you who want run miles, right? A mile is a long way to run, I can't run a mile. A kilometer is almost a mile. That's a huge volume. And we drill down two miles. 
So we, we completed this detector in 2010, yes. And that was a big engineering feat, actually. Um, these light sensors, we've buried 5,000 of these light sensors in the ice, and each one of them are about this big. I think you saw one in the video being lowered into the hole. That hole, that shoulder-sized hole, very dangerous, about yay big hole, goes down two miles. And we've been lowering and lowering all these light sensors to detect light from elementary particles down there. Um, so that's an artist's view of what it looks like. And now, let me show you what we really see. So here is an actual uh, event view or actual data from our detector. So um, every, every white line is actually a collection of dots. And every single dot is a light sensor this big. And what you're seeing here is an elementary particle, in this case a muon, go through. And this muon may have been caused by a neutrino. And when it goes through, it emits Trankov light. So the blue that you see here, the blue cone that you see here, is actually an artist's rendition of the Trankov light. That's not real data. But the dots become colored in larger or smaller. That's real data that we've collected at the, the observatory. So the larger the dot is, the more light that that um, photon detector, the light detector, saw. And then the color corresponds to time. So it should go uh, red or yellow as early and then to, to green, then blue. And, and this, is, this is a real particle going through our detector. And you can see this red line is something we've worked very hard to reconstruct. And you can see that it points back. So there was a particle out there that way in the sky. It came from that way, right? And, and we can figure out if there's an interesting galaxy, black hole, star that happened over there. So that's the gist of how my detector, our detector works. We, we spend a lot of computational resources reconstructing the direction. Um, well, you saw the light. So OK, so that was really slowed down. Actually, it happens in about, uh, I would say, a couple hundred nanoseconds. Right. But our, our, our clocks on these light sensors are so good that we can tell if it was this way or this way. So we can reconstruct fairly well. Good question. So I, I'm going to break here and tell you a little bit about how I get to the South Pole. <laughs> this is my show and tell part of the, the slides. So if you think about Antarctica, you, look, you imagine a map, right? And Antarctica is like this thing that's kind of long in the bottom of the map, but it's actually not a long thing in the bottom of the world. That's just a projection problem, right? Because the, the world is actually round. Um, so if you look at, take a globe, a real globe, and then look at upside down, uh, this is what Antarctica looks like. That's the outline of the continent. And in order to go there, what we do is we first fly to Christchurch, New Zealand, which is right here on the South Island of New Zealand. And then there we exit the regular you know, uh, airport, the, the Christchurch airport. And then we go to the next building over, which is this building. It says United States Antarctic Program Passenger Terminal, or USAP Terminal. And this is really the entry point to Antarctica. Um, this is where you get all your gear. So if you remember the first picture of me, I was in full gear. Those are all on loan from the government. Um, the government has an obligation to not kill you. So <laughs> it turns out that you can show up in New Zealand with a tank top and pair of shorts, and they give you enough clothes and underwear and socks and boots to make sure that you come back alive. Um, so they give you great gear. Uh, this was my parka. And I'm um, sorry it's too blurry, but there is, it's gonna, it says United States Antarctic Program or USAP. And then there's the logo of the Antarctic continent. And we all get the same thing. So we all look alike. Uh, um, here is a map of the stations in Antarctica. Um, the, the Antarctic continent actually has a lot of uh, different countries have stations on them. And the, the biggest station of all is McMurdo Station in the US. And our first journey from New Zealand is always to McMurdo Station. So uh, I take a huge cargo plane to McMurdo Station. Here I am arriving at McMurdo. And I'm really happy because it's my first step on Antarctica. Um, there's me inside the cargo plane. I look pretty happy still. And then uh, here's Ivan the Terabus. So the, the runway at McMurdo Station is ice. 
and, and the planes land on wheels, as you can see. And then because they look for a place where there's very stable and good ice for, for aircrafts to land, it's a little bit far from the, the actual station. So this, this bus with the huge wheels, they take us to the base. And so um, this is what McMoto Station looks like. Um, here is some uh, ice breakage from, I think there was an icebreaker that came in, a huge ship. This is from a hill next to McMurdo Station, looking at the station. And it's really, um, even though it's Antarctica, it, it's, it's really what I would imagine like a coastal town in Alaska to be like. It's, it's cold, but not, uh, you know, I might die cold. <laughs> and there's wildlife in McMurdo Station, um, big population of people and wildlife and everything else. And it's so you're excited to be in Antarctica, but it's not quite South Pole yet. Then you go to the South Pole. So there's another flight. Um, this is about a two and a half hours. The first flight is about five hours. And the second flight is about two and a half hours or three hours, depending on conditions. And here, noticeably smaller plane. So that's me and the plane that takes me from McMurdo to South Pole Station. And a lot of people go to Antarctica, but not a lot of people go to South Pole. So when you go arrive at McMurdo Station and you tell people, oh, I'm just on transit to the South Pole, everybody like, wow. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I'm going to the South Pole. <laughs> Even though I have no clue what I'm doing. And I don't really know. So, so it's, it's kind of like a, like a cool thing in Antarctica if you're going to the South Pole, apparently. Yeah, cool thing. <laughs> Pun intended, yes. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is, I don't know if you can make it up, but this plane has wheels and skis because it'll take off in wheels and land in skis at the, uh, at the South Pole Station. That's me um, in front of the cockpit pit, so if you go through those doors, it's the cockpit. The, that's, the, that's the pilots um, flying this plane. You can tell they're really paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> They're not. It's scary. <laughs> but they've done this so many times, and it's, it's um, routine for them, although I'm like, oh my god, I'm flying over Antarctica. Uh, beautiful transit at, at uh, Antarctic mountains, um, so the scenery is just breathtaking. It's from that place, in front of the cockpit, if I look back, I, I see this. So this is the cargo area of the plane, so it is really a small plane that takes us there. And then you land at South Pole Station, and it's nothing like you've ever seen before. It is amazingly flat, white, and nothing lives there. I've heard it compared to Southern Illinois. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I know there's always people from Southern Illinois in the audience, and I feel bad about it, but it's such a good joke that I can't not do it. I apologize. OK. so. Um, so now there's, there's, instead of a runway, there's a ski way for the plane, um, and, and that's the plane landing and skis. And, and really, it's this breathtaking place. Uh, really, there is nothing living there. So bacteria, wildlife, there's none of that because it's way too cold. The only thing living there is, is us and whatever came with us in the station. Um, so, okay. Last video, um, so I got kind of giddy at the South Pole, so here's me at the South Pole point. Oh. I'm gonna run around the world! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it's done! Okay, so in my defense. <laughs> In my defense, that was the warmest day, and we were kind of happy that it didn't hurt to be outside. So <laughs> that's why I look so happy there. Um, yes. OK. Uh, here is an aerial view of the South Pole Station. So um, let's see. This is the skiway that I mentioned. Here is our very modern and nice uh, station building, which is a two-story building on stilts. And this is where you live and work, um, well, sometimes live and work and all our, our meals are here. Um, on the other side of the skiway is what we call the counting house, or ice cube lab. So this is where all our computers are housed for the experiment, but the actual experiment itself is buried under this large footprint here. What is it like to live at South Pole? Um, well, it's not so different from when I live in Philadelphia. There's commuting, there's working, those are all the cables that come in from two miles underground, and they, they all come up and feed into a computer, and that's where I am at the computing house. Um, it's cold, it's actually cold, and uh, I was there in the summer, 
um, austral summer when the population is large. So I was in the overflow tent, so I was in a heated tent. <laughs> That's where I slept. Uh, interesting things about the South Pole. So um, here is two screens that are around South Pole Station that you get used to seeing. Um, things that tell you think, uh, about the, the conditions outside, which, which is always good to know. And then this, this is the most important thing. Um, this is when we get internet. <laughs> so if you know anything about geosynchronous orbits, you know that if you're at the poles, you can never get a geosynchronous orbit, right? <laughs> So we have a couple of satellites that fly by the South Pole once in a while, every day. And, and these are the times we may or may not get internet at the South Pole. Uh, otherwise, we do not get internet. <laughs> so it's funny because um, you'd be at the, the cafeteria eating lunch and finishing up and then 202 <coughs> comes around and then everybody goes away. Everybody's on their computer. Data must be transferred. Um, and, and you know, there's, there's there's two purposes, right? We have to transmit things about physics and also post Facebook posts. So that's what happens. <laughs> the station, the South Pole station is actually, it's so cold there that in the winter, the planes can't take off or land. So the station closes. It completely shuts down um, around February, March. And then right around now is when it reopens because you know our our winter is their summer or sorry excuse me our our summer is their winter so they they're closed for the winter when we are in summer um, but we don't just leave we we, we leave people behind <laughs> so uh, that's called winter overing and you can volunteer believe it or not these are all volunteers who decided that it was a good thing to do to spend eight months in a closed location where nobody can get to even in a medical emergency with no sunlight because the sun doesn't rise during the winter at the South Pole yes this is a picture of them. I was not there. This, the, so from here on, up till now, these were all my pictures. From here on out, uh, I got these pictures from my uh, fellow winter over friend. Uh, these are winter overs who are waving bye to the last plane leaving for the season. They will not see another plane or another human being for another seven months. Yes. Here is a picture of sunset at the South Pole. So what does the sun do at the South Pole? It, it just circulates around overhead, but gradually it sets and you have this two or three weeks of long sunset where the sun is just at the horizon and just spinning around every day. And it's gorgeous, I've been told. And then the winter comes and it's aurora time. And you have these beautiful auroras. This is the one thing I wish I could see in the winter at the South Pole, but not worth sacrificing my sanity over. <laughs> Here are, so every experiment, so the, the USAP, USAP itself as an organization sends support staff as winter over. So there are engineers, cooks, um, nurses, doctors, you name it. There are people there. There are about 30 or 40 that get left behind. And then every experiment at the South Pole, there, there are a handful, um, designate winter over. So Ice Cube sends two people as winter overs every year. This is actually a, a public call. Uh, it's, it's an open invitation for everybody to apply. And Eric and Camille pictured here were the winter overs, I believe, for 2013 season. Um, so all the pictures I have are from them. You can winter over too. <laughs> we only require a minimum knowledge of computers and a bachelor's degree. <laughs> If you think spending 13 months at the South Pole sounds like a fun job, we are looking for our 2016-17 winter over, so please apply. What does it pay? <laughs> well, the pay is well, um, but also you have to understand that you have no expenses, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, back to science. The Ice Cube collaboration, which I am a part of, is a large collaboration like many other particle physics experiments. We're about 300, two, two, 300 physicists uh, from 40 institutions from 15 countries around the world. So I am truly part of a huge international effort in, in discovering and making neutrino astronomy a reality. We have a diverse program that I will not get into um, because I just don't have time to do any of this justice. But let me tell you what we did in 2013 and what I'm interested in. So here's a bit of physics. 
I've drawn an energy line here. So the more right you go, right for you guys, right? Right, right you go, the higher energy it is. And in particle physics, we use these crazy units called EV, electron volts. That is the measure of energy. Um, to translate that, I've converted that into the amount of dynamite explosion it is. So 19, 10 to the 19 EV is about, if you hold one milligram of dynamite and explode it, that's how much energy it, it is. Okay. And here I've put in the, the highest energy particles ever observed in, in humanity, basically. Um, and the highest, highest, highest is actually what we think is nuclei charged, charged particles. And we've observed it up to 10 to the 21 EV, which is like a milligram of dynamite exploding. That much energy packed into one tiny particle, subatomic particle, that you can't even see. Imagine what kind of process in the universe has to happen to accelerate a tiny particle that you cannot even see to having the same amount of energy as a macroscopic amount of dynamite. There are truly interesting things going on in our universe that we don't know about. And actually, we don't know where these come from because, again, they bent in the mag magnetic field, so they don't point back. This is a huge mystery. Um, We've seen light go all the way up to about 10 to the 13 EV. So now we're, we're going lower in energy, but that is still higher than what we can accelerate particles up to. So if you've heard of the LHC and the Higgs boson discovery at, at this international collider, what does a collider do? We accelerate particles and smash it against each other. Um, when we accelerate particles to extreme energies, what we're saying is we accelerate it to this much. You, you see that this is not as much as what the universe can do. So we are not a, good at accelerating particles as much as the universe. In 2013, we discovered a neutrino that is at extremely high energies. And this was the first ever neutrino to discover it to be from outside our galaxy. This was a huge discovery that IceCube had. Um, I cannot give a physics talk without one plot, so bear with me here, okay? This is the only plot, a technical plot that I will show, show you, but I think you, 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 I have faith in you. Okay, here is a log log plot. If that means nothing to you, don't worry about it. This is the energy of the neutrino. The more right you go, the higher in energy that neutrino is. This is the flux of the neutrino. The higher you go up, the more neutrinos you expect. So this plot is telling me at this energy, how many neutrinos should I expect? Okay. Don't worry about the red and blue lines. Let's worry about the black and green. The black line is what the Earth produces. What can we tell from that? We can tell that as you go higher in energy, there are more or less neutrinos produced by the Earth. Less. less. Very good. There are less. So the higher and higher in energy you go, the, the less and less neutrinos are produced because the Earth is not very energetic. We're, we're, we're living in a very nice, stable planet, it turns out. And so they don't produce extremely high energy neutrinos, and so it goes away. The universe, it was predicted for a long time, and we've confirmed this recently. We, Ice Cube Collaboration, confirmed this. We think it doesn't go down. So what does that mean? If you see a particle at very high energies, like here-ish, Chances are that is from the universe rather than Earth. That is from somewhere outside the universe rather than Earth. That's why seeing a high energy neutrino is extremely important because the higher in energy you see something, the more sure we are that it was not produced locally, not at Earth, not even in the solar system. It was produced outside our galaxy. So that's why it was such a big deal. Um, so I, I didn't know what to compare it to, so I, I googled Kansas City aerial shots. <laughs> and this is what I came up with. Um, I shouldn't say this, but I'm a San Francisco Giants fan. I'm sorry. I know, I know, right? I know. Okay, so, so you probably know how big these things are. Um, so our highest energy event looked like that. This is the amount of light this neutrino deposited in our detector. You can be parking lot to parking lot on the other side. One subatomic particle that you can't even see deposited light, a huge area in our detector. That's how energetic that, that energetic neutrino was. 
This created a lot of buzz in, in our scientific community. We graced the cover of a lot of prestigious scientific journals. Um, and we were really popular in the popular media. It, it was a really interesting time for me. I was one of the main authors of the paper, of the discovery paper, and so I did a lot of media and I learned a lot about scientific writing and how these, the, the scientific reporters really, I, I can spend an evening talking about this, but um, there is very wide variety in, in scientific writing. And so um, I, I have nothing against Fox News. I, I don't. But the, I, this is one interview I did where I was particularly upset to see the title, Extraterrestrials on Earth, Scientists Find Outer Space Stuff <laughs> at the South Pole. Stuff. After like two hours of talking to this writer, which I'm sh you can't read it, so that's good. <laughs> so, so this, and this is their science writer. <laughs> So, okay. Um, and then, then I was like, maybe this is a tribute to the thing. So the, for those of you younger people in the audience, you don't know this film in 1982, uh, there was this sci-fi film about a remote Antarctic base fighting aliens. So maybe that was, an, that was a tribute. I don't know. Uh, you never know. There, there was, and there was, a, there was a book as well, actually. And there's also a prequel to this movie as well. Uh, interesting winter over tradition. When the last plane leaves and everybody says bye, apparently they all go to the, the video room, the VCR room in the station, and they all watch the same thing together. <laughs> you have to have that kind of sense of humor to winter over, and so good for them. Okay, but um, so the real question we, we really do want to answer in astronomy is where do these super high energy neutrinos come from? Why, why are they, what is, what is it in, out in the universe that can accelerate tiny particles to such high energies where it produces light in, in this huge area, right? We don't understand that, and, and we want to know. And, and this is really what, what my passion is. This is my, my research. Um, so again, uh, I've already covered this. How do you know there is a star here but not around it? Because the photons emitted from that star catch your eyes. And you know that a lot more photons came from this part in the sky than this part in the sky, right? This is how your eyes act as a telescope. They catch photons and they can tell which part of the sky they came from. And you say, ah, that's a lot of photons from right there, but nothing from around it. That must be something there. That's how you know there's a star. Okay, well, we like to do the same in neutrinos. So we map all the neutrinos we ever find in this plot, and here is a projection plot. I will not get into this, um, but if, for those of you who know, this is called equatorial coordinates. So this is the sky plotted onto a 2D map, if you will. And we plot all of this, the neutrinos, even, even the ones we think are, are from Earth and we don't, or we're not really interested in. Um, we plot it because, because the, the, ones, the background ones aren't going to cluster. They're, they're not going to be from a point, actually, in this projection. But stars will. The stars will be a point in this projection. So we want to know, is there a point in the sky that has a lot of clustering of events? And by eye, it, the, the answer is no, right? You can't tell if, if there's an obvious spot of neutrino stars. Um, just to show you that I am not... Um, you know, I am smart. We do a lot of, we do a lot of statistical analysis on these. Um, uh, so if, you, if you really want to ask me, this is what I spent most of my day on, so if you want to ask me about this, I'm happy to chat offline, but let's not, let's not drag everybody else through this, okay? Uh, and then uh, we produce a, a sky map like this that, that actually takes into account what our backgrounds should look like, what a star or a galaxy would look like in neutrinos. And the color scale here translates to how likely is it that there's something interesting in that sky, that part of the sky. And we see uh, a couple of spots emerging. But statistics tells us, um, and that's what p-value means, that that's, that's not as significant. That's, it's not significant enough to say that there's actually something out there. So in, in the analogy of us looking at the night sky, it's like, well, maybe there's a hot spot there, but I can't. I can't tell if it's a star or just my eyes, right? That, that's where we are in terms of neutrino astronomy. We have not discovered the f first source yet. So where do we stand? And, and this is my last slide. Um, 
in 2013, we, we started seeing extremely high energy neutrinos from outside our galaxy. And in fact, we've been collecting many of them ever since. Um, and we analyze and analyze and analyze this. Um, but even then, we still don't know what produces them. We don't know what kind of things out there in, in the universe are capable of producing such high energy neutrinos. But we're on it. We're, we're really trying. Um, we're collecting more data. And this is truly an international effort, and we are there because we want to know what happens in our universe. That's our only drive. So that's a great reason to form a collaboration. And here is the last picture I have. Uh, this is Antarctica on the winter, or South Pole at the winter, I'm sorry, and a huge question mark aurora on top of all where Ice Cube is buried. And I think that was symbolic to end the talk. And thank you so much for your attention. All right, we have time for a few questions. Raise your hand, I'll come by with the microphone. We're videotaping, and we also have a live stream audience, so we want to get your questions on the audio. <laughs> Let me fight the light. If the, if the neutrinos do not interact frequently, how did you get so many light hits when that muon went flying through? Yes, very good question. I did sweep that under the rug. <laughs> so, Usually when I do this talk in a, in, a, in a, like a physics department colloquium, I have a slide that says our, our asset is our weakness. <laughs> it actually goes to that point directly. So that is, a, the, that is an actual uh, question that we have to address in particle physics. And the, the answer is it's hard. So um, since it goes through everything, most of the times these neutrinos actually go through a detector. We don't get an interaction from them. It's only one in a billion or, or maybe even smaller that we see something interact. But we know from uh, particle physics theory what that odds are. So if we see one, we know that a million or a billion of them pass through of the same quality that we didn't see. And, and that's a really unsatisfying answer, um, I understand. <laughs> but uh, so, so basically, it's by chance. It doesn't happen that often. And that's why we have such a huge detector. The reason why we have such a huge detector and, and other physics experiments, it's much smaller is because neutrinos don't interact. So we need to give it a, a lot of chance, a lot of volume to interact. Um, because if it's this small, chances are everything is going to pass through it. We will never see an interaction. So that relates to the size of our experiment, the fact that we are dealing with neutrinos. What, <clears throat> what generates the light photon that you're actually visualizing? Another thing I swept under the rug. Man, you guys are good. OK. <laughs> Okay, I should, have, I should have just given you the physics talk, the, the physics colloquium <laughs> talk. Um, <laughs> so, okay, bear with me. Neutrinos come in and interact. They, they a lot of times create, actually almost all the time, create a charged particle such as electrons or muons. And charged particles, when they go faster than the speed of light, but not in vacuum, but in a media, so that if the speed of light in ice is such, and these part charged particles go faster than that, which you're allowed to do in physics and not violate any laws, then they emit Cherenkov radiation. And it's much like the sonic boom in jets. Um, if you go faster than sound, you get this amazing uh, sound explosion. And it's the light equivalent of that. So you have such a high energy charged particle, and, 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 and electric charge relates to light in fundamental physics. And so if you go faster than light in, in that media, you can never go faster than light in vacuum, but if you can go faster than light in ice, then you can emit these sonic boom radiating lights, and that's what we see. I'm curious about the detector itself. Uh, I'm trying to get a feel for if it has to be very, very sensitive to low level light is like a photomultiplier tube. Yes. Um, oh, is it a photomultiplier? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. And then the, the second question is, uh, what is the uh, angular resolution of your neutrino telescope? I really should have just given you the physics <laughs> this is This is like, I spent three slides on this at physics colloquiums. Um, that's a very good question. So if you're going to do astronomy, you have to know how well you can point, right? We have about, mm, at best, 0.1 degrees in the sky. Um, if you're an astronomer, you should be appalled by that number because it is very large. And, and that's, some of it is, this is so new technology that we're still figuring out what, how to do this. But uh, another thing is this. We never detect the neutrinos directly. 
again, going back to the previous question, we actually detect the, the interaction products of the neutrino. So there's all, already an angular uncertainty between the neutrino and the particles it produces after it interacts. So that is a physical limit that we cannot do anything about. That is just our nature-given condition. Um, and, and that uh, is, is not insignificant, but there, there is a lot of that error has to do with our instrument and how well we can even reconstruct the, the thing they produced. And, and that's, that's something that we work very hard on to reduce. Actually, that's, we, we have a, a huge group, international group, working on exactly reducing that error because that is so crucially important to astronomy. Very good questions. All right, we have a question from an online viewer, Olivia. Hi, Olivia wants to know, what was the most difficult thing you encountered in Antarctica? Oof, so many to choose from. <laughs> um, so I, I had talked about this this afternoon. I had a session with the students, which was very nice. Um, so before I went to the South Pole, I, I knew about this modern building. It's, it's you know, air conditioned. There's electricity. I, I am not a girl that likes roughing it, and so I hate camping and things like that. And I was like, how hard could it be? It's a modern building. It's, a, it's nice. So I go there, and the first thing that hits you, because you came from McMurdo Station, which is at the coast, to two miles of ice, is the altitude. So you get altitude sick right away coming off the plane. The plane is pressurized. And then you take a step off, and you're like, wow, I can't breathe. There's no air here. And then, of course, you have on like 100 pounds of gear because it's cold. And you don't know how cold it's going to be because you've never been to the South Pole. So you put on everything that the government gave you, right, because you don't want to die. Uh, after a while, you realize that you don't need all the layers, um, especially in the summer. But you put on everything. So you, so you, put, you put on the, most he the heaviest of everything. And then you step out of the plane, and you're like, oh my god, I'm 100 pounds heavier, and I can't, I can't breathe. Oof. OK. And then the first thing to ask you to do, uh, because the South Pole Station is, is a modern building, but it's on stilts. And it's on stilts because there's a lot of snow drift from the wind. And things get buried down. So we don't want the station to get buried. So they, they're, on, they're on these legs. So you, in order to enter the station, you have to climb up a set of stairs. <laughs> so I can't breathe. I have 100 pounds of gear on me. And now you're telling me now to walk up the stairs. So I can't breathe at this point. And, and I'm like, holding onto the rails of the stairs and it's like, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't climb anymore. Oh, I should have just stayed in McMurdo. <laughs> and, and then you, you get inside and you think, oh, great, this now I'm climate controlled. It's, it's, it's fantastic on the station. Um, it turns out the station is incredibly dry because there's a huge temperature difference between the outside and the inside. So you know this because in the winter, your house is very dry, right, from the heating. So it's an extreme version of this. It's incredibly dry in the station, so much so that every time you blow your nose, you bleed. That's, that's just what happens physiologically. It is not somewhere where people should be. Um, so even in the station, you're feeling the altitude, you're feeling the dryness. Uh, it, it, it was tough to live in those conditions. Another thing that was tough, I, I don't want to dwell on it too much because it's an amazing experience as well, is that you only get to shower two minutes every week. <laughs> And the reason is this, um, it is very expensive to make water there. Because how do you make water? You melt the snow. How do you melt snow? You need energy. And energy is crucial at the South Pole. Everything has to be flown in. Um, it, it, gasoline freezes at temperatures at the South Pole, so you can't use gasoline. So the only fuel usable at the South Pole is jet fuel. So jet fuel is the bloodline of everything. It, it gives us energy. There's a generator using jet fuel. All the vehicles at the South Pole converted to taking jet fuel as their, as their a source of energy. And the, all the jet fuel used at the station has to be transported by plane, the, the plane that you saw me fly in. Um, it actually carries a, a whole lot of extra jet fuel so it can unload it at the station for survival. And you do not want to waste that jet fuel because that is your lifeline. So you do not waste it on things like showering. <laughs> So, so everybody gets two minutes a week of showering. Um, so the living conditions are not at all civil. <laughs> and that, for me, being a, being a very wussy person who hates camping, that was the toughest thing. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, potassium sometimes uh, emits a neutrino. Yes. And, but neutrinos are not part of an atom. Yes. So where does the neutrino come from? And let me, let me tag on one other one. Um, 
the light emitted, you compared it to the, to the sports stadiums. Yes. Does it ever happen above ground? Ah, good question. Okay, I like both of those questions because they're very particle physics. Um, the first question is um, you, in particle physics, and this, this, is, this is, it happens, actually happens like this. We've known this for a while. You can create particles in particle physics, or, or in the world, actually, in the universe. You are allowed to create particles as long as you have enough energy to create particles. This is E equals mc squared, really, at the fundamental of it. Energy is mass, and mass is energy. So if you have energy, you can convert it to mass. What is mass? It's actually a particle that has mass, right? And, and so you are, when, when you emit potassium, that, uh, sorry, a neutrino from potassium decay, that potassium atom actually loses energy because it has to create a new particle for you. And that's E equals mc squared at work. So that's, that's really fundamental physics, and I'm glad you asked that. The second question is also fabulous because um, the, these showers, they, they do sometimes happen high in the atmosphere, but very rarely. And the reason is this. It's all about what we call cross-section. Um, so if you think about the amount of stuff at the, at the high atmosphere, there's not a lot of stuff. On ice, there's a solid. So there's a lot of atoms per square, whatever you want, or cubic. Per, per given volume, if I have a handful of ice, there's a lot more atoms in there than high up in the air, where there's very few particles because there's not a lot of air high up. So it's really an argument about what are the chances you encounter something to interact with. And the denser the material is, the better chance you have. So that's why it is very unlikely for that to happen very high in the atmosphere, at least for neutrinos. This is a geology question, yes. or glaciology question. <laughs> Does your experimental array, is it um, at all at risk for, because of the fact that glacial uh, flow? And how long do you expect the um, array to be viable? Great question. Um, again, I should have just given the physics colloquium talk. <laughs> I am regretting not doing that. Um, yes. Yes, we, we, we do think about this. So Antarctica as a continent has, has a huge glacier on top and basically the whole glacier is slipping into the ocean. That's, that's its, its normal state. Um, so our experiment is moving. And in fact, our station is moving. Um, to, to actually tell you the truth, the South Pole marker, the marker you saw at the beginning of the talk, they have to replant that every year in a different location, not because the South Pole moves, but because we move because we're on the glacier. Interesting. So as long as we all move with it, cable and all, we're OK. <laughs> but the interesting thing is this. Um, it's not just everybody's shift. Uh, we've discovered, actually, IceCube discovered, a particle physics experiment discovered uh, that at the South Pole, the, the ice has some shear force to it. So it's not everybody sliding down, but there's also some, some tension stretching the ice in a preferential direction. And we see this because the light that we should see this way and this way are different from the particles. So now you're using particle physics to do glaciology. Isn't that interesting? And, and so we are at the forefront of this as well, the, the glaciological side of this. We have glaciologists in our experiment, on our collaboration, and, and they're truly interested in this. And, and so there, we didn't know about this shear force that, that affects the ice. Um, it is small enough that we don't think it'll destroy our experiment in any sort of our lifetime. Um, but we do see the properties of ice shifting because of glaciology, and that's something we have to calibrate against because we, we can't just assume that, oh, this particle this came, that came in this way didn't emit as much light as this way. It's actually just the property of ice. So we have to actually know about these things and calibrate it out. And there is a huge effort in the collaboration to, to understand the ice and to calibrate that out so we don't bias our particle physics knowledge of the data. So I have difference in top and below. Absolutely. The ice is layered. So the, it, to first order, what happens is snow falls at the South Pole and it gets compressed and compressed and compressed. So the further down you go, the further back in history you are going. Um, interesting thing is, uh, at the South Pole Station, the drinking water we get is from a, a well, which is just basically a hot rod in the, s the snow. And because the surface can be dirty because humans have been there for a while, uh, they, they dig, I forget, not that deep, maybe 10 meters, so not, not too deep. Um, but apparently that's, 
that's the ice there that we're drinking is snowfall during Jesus' time. So it's like 2,000 years old. <laughs> right? It's, it's interesting to think about things like this. All right, we have a question towards the back of the room on your left. 20 years from now, what do you expect to learn from neutrinos and how? I really should have given that. <laughs> All your questions are answered in the particle physics colloquium version of my talk, in which, great credit to you, you actually asked the questions that particle physicists ask me. I hope we have a sky map of neutrinos that tell us where all the neutrino sources are. I want to see a lot of black holes resolved with our data. I want to see a lot of star explosion supernovae resolved in our data. And I hope we have a map of the universe in neutrinos where we can say, ah, so this is what the universe looks like in neutrinos. I, I would love to come back in a decade or two and, and tell you about that. that that's my goal. And that's a great way to end the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Thank you. And thank you for attending tonight. And thank you to our online viewers for participating in our program this evening. Don't forget, November 5th, Gene Kranz. We still have seats available, but not many seats. So go home and register. So thank you and good night.